Okay, here we are with Teotihuacan. Um, I don't know how many here have heard of Teotihuacan or um, have been there, maybe. Teotihuacan is this incredible archaeological site that we have from human history that dates back to 100 BC. Um, it's a civilization lived there from 100 BC to around 750 AD. So we're, we're close to, to 2000 years ago. And this city was remarkable in, in many ways. And before I launch into this brief introductory section, right, there's gonna be several sections after this that will talk more um, in a more elaborate manner about some of the things I touch upon in the next 15 or so minutes. I just would like to say that with, with something like Teotihuacan and, and studying an ancient culture um, and giving it the respect that it deserves, one has to recognize the degree to which it acts um, metaphorically as uh, the tip of the iceberg, right? This, this phrase. So what does the tip of the iceberg phrase refer to? Well, we, we're only seeing the very surface of something that that has many tendrils and um, many other meanings than than what we can imagine from from what we see, right? We're always kind of um, extrapolating from a from a from a hint of information, from from some clues that have been left, because time has taken its toll on on the on the artifacts and the objects and and on human memory, right? Things have been uh, effaced. Is that the is that the term? They've been uh, disintegrated they've been you know um if it's wooden it's rotten it brought it away you know like some of these had wooden um platforms or with grass roofs or or what color were they right we always have to imagine we're in this place of imagination and so when we walk down the halls of, of a metropolitan museum of art and we see roman sculptures that are all white and greek sculptures well, what if they were brightly painted Right. And what has time done to these? So, so there's, there's there's two avenues to go about this this tip of the iceberg metaphor. One is simply we're dealing with corporeal objects, real objects that can decay and we have what's left. And if there's a beautiful statistical analysis of that, right, if we if we have five things that are red and there were a million things, what are what are the chances that that most of them were red? Right. Like we see only red things right now, but but that does not mean that there were all red things. But why did those red things survive? Why? Why were we able to save those? You know, who stole those red things before something flooded or, or whatever the narrative is of, of the way the thing was salvaged. Right. A, a lot of Mexican art was was robbed and stolen and taken and disseminated. Um, and so, so that's that's interesting in of itself. What survives from ancient civilizations simply due to the pressures on the thieves, right? The the market that was available on on stolen goods, and you know there was some some trend that liked small figurines, and so we have those left before some fire occurred from some uh, archaeological site. So that that's just a tangent. The point is that we're dealing with the iceberg scenario, and and the other track, right? So this track of the corporeal objects, and and determining from them what what was the general vibe of a place. On the other track, we have what our particular culture that has these things now knows about, and why they know about them, right? The the what happened to 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 pass through the publisher's desk and become the front cover as an image of Teotihuacan is what we know about, and and what happens to be decided as the art canon in the art historical lectures of Yale or, or wherever it is. Uh, the New York Times did a expose on Teotihuacan, and it was all pictures of the pyramids, and that's what people know about Teotihuacan, and they might not know that Teotihuacan was in fact this in, in, incredible site that was a city. It was 200,000 people, the first planned grid city that that had apartment complexes with 60 to 100 people in them that we've only excavated 40 of. We've only excavated 2% of what was happening in this, 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 um, this unbelievable um, conglomeration of, it was a cosmopolitan city uh, in, in Mesoamerica where the, the, the base in Mexico emptied out and went to this city for reasons still, still unknown. So my, my point is that on this other side of thinking about the iceberg, we have, um, we have like, like what, what's been promoted, 
right by the by the promoters uh, at at B for a particular time. So so that's uh, that's really important to consider that that maybe we should look at what's not obvious. That's all I'm trying to say. That's a, that's a very long winded way of saying that with art history and uh, and history and um, looking at things that part of art is maybe looking around the, around the corner. And, and that might be a way of looking at ourselves uh, a little a, a little differently or with some nuance that could be fun, right? It could be fun to look at what you're not supposed to look at. Um, so, so here we are looking at a pyramid. Now a pyramid calls a great amount of attention. And I'm not relegating that and saying we should look at small, uh, precious figurines made from obsidian. But but maybe it could be more nuanced. Like, yes, pyramids are still incredible for us to look at. They might be the reason that most people know about Teotihuacan. Still, humans are still duped by this uh, this grand scale because it's true. It's 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 an expose. It shows that the Teotihuacan civilization was able to employ, uh, for lack of a better word right now, they were able to use many, many people like worker ants to, to fill this with a, with a clay fill, right? These pyramids are just massive mounds of, of effort. <laughs> so, um, so that's still shocking today to see the, their scale. Um, these things mimic the surrounding um, uh, hillsides and, uh, and it was it was miraculous then. And, and the Aztecs, when they found this, you know, often people think that the Aztecs built Teotihuacan or the Mayans or no one could figure out who built the Toltecs. My grandfather was there in 1935 and he made a movie and he talked about the Toltecs uh, built the pyramids. But no, the Teotihuacanans built the pyramids. And. Um, and so we're going to just kind of briefly go through. Go through some more images here. This is my my picture of the. Uh, the tip of the iceberg. So here's some facts. Um, I've stated some of them already. At, at the time of its existence, it was the sixth largest city in the world. Um, I have here that one million cubic um, feet of of clay was was packed to make the pyramid of the sun. Um, there's there's about you can kind of break up the Teotihuacan these into these three structures, I guess, which is often done. And if you go there, you're, you're you're kind of funneled in to see the the pyramid of the sun, pyramid of the moon, and then you have the um, the the pyramid of the feathered the temple of the feathered serpent, which is which is down here. So there's these three, and it's it's the city is built into these quadrants of this avenue of the dead. It's called. Um, this is this long avenue here. It's a originally they thought it was two miles, um, but now we, we realize that it's four miles long. So, so what is four miles? So where we are now for, for our course, where we're having this talk and, and uh, for all of you who are not where we are in California, you can surmise from this and, and get a, a physical sense of what we're talking about. So four miles is from the, from the ocean side here, Pacific Grove in Monterey County, all the way up to, to Route 1 there. So we're talking about a, an avenue of the dead is, is that long. And then in terms of the size the the scope of the city, it's 15 square miles. So if you if you drove down to Garapata State Park and, and enjoyed the view and maybe saw some otters and uh, and made a rectangle square, if you could get over the the uh, the wilderness there, which is quite difficult actually to get into Carmel Valley, and um, that made that rectangle, that that would be the size of the the city that we're talking about. Um, classic Teotihuacan. So, so Teotihuacan is um, here on the map of, of Mexico, and it um, it was unprecedented. It's very different compared to the Olmec and Mayan um, cultural landscape. And if I return to my fact page here, um, it was a cosmopolitan city. So there's, there's evidence of it as a cosmopolitan city. Each of these apartment compounds may have been ethnically or trades or culturally divided there there's remnants of of um remains that are that are uh that are zapotec oriented and there's remnants uh, in one apartment compound and um maybe mayan in another uh, i believe so there's there's this kind of evidence of kind of cultural um pockets within this city living situation um and 
it's in the Teotihuacan Valley within the basin of Mexico was was inhabited a lot later than the rest of Mexico. And uh, and what's unique is that there was this volcanic eruption and, and people fled that. And they think that that's part of how Teotihuacan came to be. But in reality, the pyramids were built and 100,000 people were living there. And and then the apartment complexes were built. So that's that's interesting to think about. Like th these apartment complexes were, were, were built out of a need. Was it always the plan? How, how did we arrive at that? Now, on top of this very um, specifically planned city, uh, for the first time in the history of the basin of Mexico, it emptied of all the little farms and they all kind of sucked into the city. And that, that doesn't necessarily, um, that wouldn't have necessarily been conducive to, uh, to, to a healthy living. Like it might've done made more work for people to have to go further for food. So that was a, that's an interesting element to this. Um, I think I've already mentioned that only 40 of these apartment compounds have been excavated. We're talking about only 2% of, of what we know about. Um, and maybe the last thing, the, the, the really interesting thing about Teotihuacan is that there is, um, there's no like painting of a, of a king or a leader. It's uh, there's no like venerated um, dynastic worship type energy going on. It's very, um, subdued, cosmic, and uh, not really lauding an individual unique character. There, there, there isn't a single record of conquest. And if you compare that to any other ancient civilization, there's no like, there's no warlord who who killed these people and look how great I am and 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 pay your taxes kind of energy. Um, it's a it's a, it's characterized by a kind of um, a like a uniformity and simplicity. And also uh, it has an element of mass production. So enough, enough talking and let me just um, show, well, I'll keep talking, but let me show a couple more, more pictures to kind of help um, elucidate the situation. So that's Pyramid of the Sun. And uh, this is another map showing the main, the main drag here. And these are these different apartment compounds that have been excavated and I'll be showing works from there. Um, and uh, this is Teotihuacan um, when the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon were still unexcavated, grown over. And that's a whole nother kind of crazy history of how they became to be excavated and incorrectly. And um, there's pyramids within pyramids. You know, they were built over time, but um, they were stripped down um, in a very strange way, the way that they were originally excavated. And then these are pictures of... Um, this is the butterfly palace with these beautiful um how would you say it, kind of tetris um relief forms with a kind of monochromatic facade this is at the telco so like some people will call it a palace some people call it an apartment um what were these things uh, this is a beautiful space where there's there's a red on white painting and a on one in one building and a white on red in another building. This is um, a lot of the apartment complexes had a, a center from from what I understand a, a center area where light would come in and um, you could control the water. There could be like a, a a basin of water that could be let out or let in. Um, I guess one thing that, that I didn't quite say yet is that. You know, imagine our civilization, and and we're talking about Teotihuacan. It lasted for eight hundred years, so I don't think people think about this very often. So, so what? How long has our civilization lasted? When did our civilization start? What what is our, you know, what is our culture that has that has worked? What has worked for a period of time? Eight hundred years ago was twelve hundred A.D. So it's just kind of food for thought. This this culture lasts for eight hundred years as the center cultural socio political center of, of all of Mexico, having influence, you know. Um, all the way down to Guatemala. So this is the Temple of the Feathered Serpent with this, this incredible facade. And then this is the, the recreation that's in the Anthropological Museum in the city of Mexico. And this is another picture of it on site. Um, this is just to show these apartment complexes. This is a reconstruction of Tetitla. Um, which we'll show a lot of paintings from when the, the thing is when the, when the apartments were discovered 
and they saw these paintings, the historians and the, and the archaeologists, they couldn't imagine there was just kind of for living, right? These must be extremely decorated palaces. So that's like a, a debate. Um, on the right, you have an aerial view of Atatelco, which was the the place I just showed with the red on red on white and white on red uh, paintings. And this is really, um, this gets down to it kind of. Um, there's an incredible distillation of, of taste and, and style here, right? This, these are the, the thin orange ceramic ware, which are indicative of Teotihuacan. They have this, um, they're classy and um, they're very specific to Teotihuacan. I believe the, the technology or the clay comes or the, um, the process comes from Puebla, I believe. And they're beautiful. And then on the right, you have another whole set of ceramic making these kind of, they're known for these kind of tripod foot vessels with this, these, these paintings on them that are spectacular. Um, the color of that pink to green is, is really beautiful with these interlacing, um, you know, these white bows or, or how, ribbons, however you want to describe. Um, but there's like a casual art and artful, artful relaxment, you know, like it's not coming from a, what kind of template is this being arrived from? And and we'll, we'll talk about all this more in the next sections. This is really just a, I'm just kind of throwing out all that's, that's available to us to, to talk about in terms of art history, right? I want to talk about color and line quality and um, things like that, art, art terms. This is a beautiful fragment. So a lot of the work was stolen, um, just chipped off with chisels by looters. And so these are fragments. There's over 500 fragments in Mexico. I think there's up to 50 fragments in the United States. Um, we saw this a little bit with the Olmecs. This is kind of this mirror shape pendant of some kind. These are on plaster. These are on this lime plaster. There was so much lime made that they, some people think that the combination of the arid climate, right? Because Basin of Mexico is a little more arid. I mean, the Teotihuacan Valley is, is, is a little more arid. It was a little more arid. And with the deforestation due to making so much lime that would cover all of Teotihuacan, there's some research that suggests that that's part of the, the demise of the civilization. So what I'm saying is that these paintings were painted on uh, a thin coat of lime, right? So the, the plaster had to be wet and the artists had to, um, you know, just like the, the classic uh, Italian frescoes or the frescoes of Diego Rivera or, or like this wall painting. This is an original. So everything I've been showing so far are um, originals, but we have to we have to realize they've been conserved, they've been touched up. And that's a whole um, mess that you have to weed through when you're looking at these is, is how, have they been brightened? Have they been repainted? Um, what, what's original and what's not? And how do you want to approach that with your experience, your emotional experience of the works? For example, this is a recreation that's in the city of Mexico Museum of Anthropology. And um, it's an incredible image, incredible painting. This is the classic. So there's no, you know, this is the human representation. You're seeing the humans in Teotihuacan art and they're not, they're from, they're in profile. We've talked about the idea of freeze and, and profile. Um, I mean, uh, in terms of like, we looked at the Assyrians and the Egyptians, but um, you know, most of them is headdress and regalia and they're performing some kind of ritualistic function, but it's not, um, it's not like a, a, a kind of a grandeur of a, uh, of elitism or something there's a kind of they're at the service of this godlike figure who's who's in the middle this is some kind of a deity or god um there's a lot of water reference in teotihuacan and these are these incredible um on the right you have a a a sensor and then on the left you have details of of sensor objects and these are um these involve mold made clay and 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 so you have this element of mass production and uniformity and basically the idea is that these are in the apartment compounds right so we have these 2000 car compounds we've only looked at 40 of them and in the middle of each one there's there's these kind of communal um ritualistic objects for for some kind of meditation um perhaps that the incense would burn and it would come through a stove type stove pipe off the uh, off the back there 
And uh, actually, may I just go back one more? So I just want you to to see these are these are they're called a door nose, and they're pieces of ceramic that are that are mold pressed. And you can see references to see to the ocean in, in some of these, as well as other like organic objects. So the idea is that they could be rearranged based on whatever function was required for that time of year or for that particular um, group of people that lived lived in that apartment complex. Um, so there's this idea which comes up with with rearrangement in Teotihuacan at the service of some kind of individuality, individualism within an organization. So these would have been painted probably, and they can be swapped and rearranged, and they're kind of hung quite precariously on these these sculptures. This is a classic Teotihuacan stone mask. And as we've talked about, the Olmecs masks are in this pivotal place, maybe. Um, they can talk about the move from chiefdom, tribe, culture to uh, state and uh, and hierarchies of, of civilization and, um, and, and when we divide work and, and labor and class. And so these weren't meant to be worn in the way that they might have, the masks might have been used in chiefdoms, right? These are too heavy, they're stone. And so the idea is that like in the bottom left, they would be hung on, uh, on a stone sculpture, maybe in the Day of the Dead for some kind of um, organized rite or, uh, or service. And then you could, you could adorn the rest of the sculpture for that moment and put it away is, is the thought by some archeologists. Um, but now that we've seen the Olmecs, we can start to appreciate some kind of uh, the, the differences within Mesoamerican, Mesoamerican art and the similarities. And, and also now that we've paid a lot of attention to like, we talked about uniqueness and generalness um, in, in the human figure and how to represent a face. I think we can start to kind of like, I think we have more of a vocabulary and sensitivity to what these look like. You might be able to see these a little bit, a little bit with a little bit more sensitivity. So a big part of the, the of talking about Teotihuacan, Teotihuacan is talking about um, like unique versus versus general, like like we did in the in the past with with how you represent an icon or a kind of general figure versus your your neighbor or your loved one, right? Like the the, uh, the uh, 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 how you stereotype a thing in order to uh, to trade it or understand it. Um, with mold making, you can make the same thing repetitively, and then this is this is where we're, we're seeing this in abundance in Teotihuacan. You know, it's it's un, unrivaled um, historically up to that point in Mesoamerica. And so, what does that mean for that culture? So we have here molds. We have the negatives and the positives. And um, for example, you could you could press a soft material into these negatives and get these positives. And these are the, some of these are adornos that were that we call them adornos that would be that would be um, placed and, and arranged on the sensors. So we have human forms and vegetal matter and um, organic shapes and anthropomorphized animals here. Um, and then these are again, more uh, printed, pressed objects um, made to be, to be repeated and disseminated without, without a need for much attention maybe, or a different kind of attention. And so we're going to talk about this quite a bit um, after we talk about paintings from Teotihuacan. This is this incredible um, output called the hollow bodied uh, uh, figures and they're incredibly psychological. The bodies come apart and they're filled with, with objects. A lot of them are these kind of mold made objects. Um, incredible idea and, and striking works. These are the small figurines that are made out of clay. There's a whole series with these band headdresses. And this is um, an articulated puppet, right? Articulated like the arms and the, um, the legs can, can move. Um, there's a history of this around the world. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful um, part of human making. And kind of allows us access to to maybe some compassion with a, with a civilization pretty immediately, which is interesting, right? How how do we become impressed? Or by impressed, I mean how do we see ourselves or see um, like what is this human quality that we uh, 
that we attribute to to a culture that could maybe rhyme with our own perspectives and prejudices. Maybe this is the last slide I'll show. This is my map of the location of the paintings um, that are at Teotihuacan that we know about. So just to go over it one more time, this is the the day the day of the dead, the uh, Avenue of the Dead. This is the two mile length of it here. And um, here you have um, the, the Feathered Serpent Temple the pyramid of the sun and the period of the moon, these kind of testaments to, to human labor and, and uh, organization. And then um, we have Atatelco over here, we have Petitla and um, we have the butterfly palace and the, the temple of the Jaguars and Techenantitla and Tepantitla. Um, so, that's 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 a wrap kind of on on just a, a quick scatter scatter shot of the tip of the iceberg of this incredible civilization. And um, I'm really excited to talk more about it in the future sections where we will um, talk about our history terms a little bit more and talk about the art and and how to how to find ways of of, of paying attention to it and giving it giving it a little a little love. Thank you.